of you are new to Geyer Springs, we want to welcome you, and I'll just tell you on the front end, my name is Curtis Barnes, and I am the family discipleship pastor here at Geyer Springs. And so I've been here about five years, but some of you are like, I hadn't seen him for a while. I didn't even know he still worked here any longer. Uh, I do. I've been uh, spending most of my time upstairs with the venue team and the venue people up there. Although to those of you in the venue, uh, it's been a couple of weeks. So I'll reintroduce myself next week uh, as I get up there and uh, see you. I've been out uh, down here doing some things these last couple of weeks, but it's good to be with you today. The preaching depth chart runs pretty deep here at Geyer Springs, and so when the phone rings and Pastor Dave's calling down to the bullpen saying, you're up, uh, it's always an honor and a privilege. And so I am indeed thankful to be here uh, to be worshiping with you uh, today. So if you have your Bibles, take and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. Uh, we will be looking there at the healing of the paralytic. And I'm trying to get logged into my iPad here. My, it kicked me off. And those are my sermon notes. Luke chapter 5, uh, the healing of the paralytic. Uh, Jesus uh, is teaching uh, and he's ministering among the people. And we're a part of a series called Go Tell It. Uh, Pastor Dave kicked us off last week where we're talking about the most important mission given to us as believers. And that's the mission of going and sharing the gospel with a lost world. And uh, that is indeed our most important mission. And we're looking at some different situations uh, in the New Testament where that happened, where individuals did that, uh, and how people and persons responded in lessons that we can learn from that as well. So in Luke chapter 5 here, uh, we're going to have this encounter uh, with Jesus and the paralytic. And last week, Pastor Dave kicked off the series by talking about his favorite Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life. And I tried really hard this week, but there just weren't a lot of tie-ins to my favorite Christmas movie, Elf. So we're just going to focus on what's important, and that's Luke chapter 5, all right? So uh, look with me, Luke chapter 5, uh, we'll pick up in verse 15, and this is telling us what's happened right after Jesus has healed a man of leprosy. So Luke chapter 5, verse 15 says, but now even more, the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray, praying about what God would have him to do next. Verse 17 says, on one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal." So here's what's happening. Jesus is out teaching. He's out preaching. And on this particular day, some Pharisees have gathered. This is the first mention of the Pharisees in Luke's gospel. Uh, the Pharisees were a group of men who were deeply committed. They were passionate. They were zealous about God's word, about the law, about keeping the law, both supposedly for themselves and for the people they taught. But what had happened over time was they became so focused on the externals of keeping the law that they neglected the matters of the heart. And following God from a place of a right heart and a right relationship with Him. And so they drifted to the externals instead of the internal issue of the heart. And as a result, they would find themselves ultimately in opposition to Jesus and the message of the gospel. But in, here in Luke chapter 5, we find them doing what they're supposed to do as these teachers and leaders of, the, of, the, of their religion and of the law. When there was a new teacher, a new prominent individual, they would go and they would investigate. They would make sure this person uh, was following the correct teachings and interpretations of the law. And if they found the person to be a, a prophet, uh, a man of God, a man of faith, potentially even, they were also looking for the long-awaited Messiah, then they could celebrate that the Messiah had come. But if their investigation and their research determined that the individual was a false teacher, then they would find themselves having to respond and deal appropriately with that. At minimum, it was a rebuke to this false teacher or false prophet but at worst, 
it would ultimately be death for the false teachings. The irony of this is that the Pharisees were investigating, trying to make a determination about the individuals that they would see. They meet Jesus, who was indeed the Messiah, and who verified that and demonstrated that through his teachings and through his ministry and his time on earth. But the Pharisees determined that he wasn't the Messiah and ultimately orchestrated events to have Jesus killed by crucifixion which only then further verified that Jesus was the Messiah by his resurrection after his death. But here in Luke 5, we see their first interaction with Jesus to investigate his ministry. It says they came from Judea, from Galilee, and from the home office in Jerusalem. And it says the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal on this day. Jesus followed the leadings and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it was to heal. Sometimes it was to teach. Sometimes, as we saw in verse 16, it was to go away and to pray. But on this day, the Holy Spirit had led Jesus to heal. And as we'll see, there was a component of teaching as well. So verse 18 says, Behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. This is a pretty straightforward understanding of what happened here. Jesus is teaching. He's in a home. Uh, it appears to be a pretty large home because of the size of the crowd, because of the architecture, and, and what we'll see in a moment related to the roof. But as Jesus is teaching and people are packed around, word gets out, and more and more people come. And so somewhere in this, this paralyzed man and his friends, four of his friends, hear that Jesus is in town. They're like, Jesus, I know him, you know? And so they, they hear this, and they take their paralyzed friend, hoping that just maybe Jesus, the miracle worker, will indeed heal their friend. But when they get there, they find out that the condition of humanity is the same in the first century as it is today. There were so many people crowded around that they couldn't get in and no one was giving up their spot in line, right? I mean, that condition is the same today as it was in the first century. Uh, Thanksgiving Day, uh, my youngest son Daniel and I have been training for the Little Rock Half Marathon coming up in March. And I know you all looked at me and thought, that dude is a runner, isn't he? All right? <laughs> Go ahead, laugh it off, laugh it off. Anyway, so we've been running. Well, Thanksgiving Day, we were supposed to run three miles, and I said, Daniel, that's pretty boring. Why don't we at least get a shirt out of this somewhere, you know? So we signed up for a 5K, and if you've ever done one of these large races like this, what they do is, I mean, we've got thousands of people there. They have these long lines of porta potties, so you can go to the restroom before the race, and, and race etiquette is this. There's one really long line in front of a bank of 10 to 20 porta potties, and when one opens up, the next person in line steps up. So I've been in line 10 or 12 minutes, getting close to my turn, and I'm several deep, and a door opens, and a guy was walking by like this, and the door opens, and he steps in. Yeah! Yeah! The people around me were like, can you believe that guy did that? So I was like, we got to go turn it over. <laughs> so we <he> did. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Y'all, I wouldn't do that. I heard the choir go, aw. But we thought about it, all right? Because that's frustrating. You're waiting your turn in line, and somebody jumps right in front of you. And so this is Thanksgiving Day. Well, that evening, we were actually at, uh, at one of Shelly's nieces. They, they had a new home, so we went there today. And on our way home, we were going to be going by a Walmart. And my kids have never been Black Friday shopping with us because we're always doing other stuff. But we were going to go by, and they're like, Dad, can we go Black Friday shopping? And I thought, you know what, it is time you all are old enough to see the depths and depravity of the human sinful heart. So yes, we'll stop in on our way home. And so we get there, and it, at this Walmart, I don't know how they do it other places, they had these pallets all out in the middle. They were shrink-wrapped, and they had an employee guarding every pallet, right? So as we're walking through, I'm like, I'm stepping up just to see what's in there. And boy, the stares from the people who were waiting to get that out here, I'm like, don't even think about it, pal. You know, because we don't want people to get in line in front of us. None of you have ever been ungodly when somebody's running up trying to jut in front of you when the lanes compress, right? So 
you get what's happening. These people are in line to see Jesus, and this paralytic shows up, and people aren't budging. They've got a person who's in need. Maybe they themselves are in need. They can't get into the house. So these men figure out a different way. In ancient times, homes, when they, they would erect, they would build the walls, and then on the top to give them more space, when they did their roof, they would put it a few feet lower than the top edge of the wall, uh, put the thatch down with some support beams, and then so they could use the area, they would cover it with some tiles to give them a solid surface. They would have a ladder from the bottom to come up. It would give them an upstairs patio with the walls serving as protection. So these men find their way to the roof, they obviously attach ropes and they hoist their friend up on his bed. They pull back a couple of these tiles, break through the thatch, and then lower him in front of Jesus. So now imagine the experience in the house. People are listening. They're watching Jesus heal people. They're listening to him teach. You get know, all this commotion up above, dust and dirt as they're breaking through the thatch. And then this man comes down on this bed in front of Jesus, and all eyes are on Jesus. What's he going to do? go get in line, buddy, it's not your turn? I mean, is, is he going to heal him? What's going to happen? No one knows, but I don't think anyone was expecting what actually did indeed happen. Verse 20, when he saw their faith, the faith of the man who was there for the miracle, but also the faith of his friends who were like, we know that Jesus can do something in your life, and we so desperately want Jesus to do something in your life that we're going to do everything that we can to get you in the presence of Jesus. It says, when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven. This is the first miracle in this passage. And the miracle is this. It is the miracle of salvation. The fact that Jesus, who is pure and holy and righteous, would forgive the sins of any sinful, broken, desperate human being is a miracle. That because of his love and his grace and his mercy, he receives us to himself. Jesus speaks and forgives this man of his sins. And churches, we're here today. I hope that you never forget the joy and the incredible gift that you have received that Jesus receives you in spite of your sins. And by his own death and by his effort, not your effort, not your works, not your merit, because we have nothing of value, nothing to bargain with, but because of his grace and his mercy, Jesus forgives our sins. And so Jesus does this for this man. He says, man, your sins are forgiven. That was the greatest need in this man's life. Now, maybe not everybody recognized that, but that was his greatest need, because here's the thing. Even if Jesus had stopped there and not healed the man of his paralysis, when his life was over, he would indeed be in the presence of Jesus in perfection for the rest of eternity. He would no longer have to deal with the effects and the consequences of sin that we see in this broken and, fa and fallen world. And recognize that we do live in a broken world. Illnesses, sickness, death, and disease are all a result of sin entering into this world. It's broken. And only through Jesus, only ultimately in eternity, will it be made right and anew to where we will no longer deal with those consequences, with those issues. So Jesus performs the miracle of saving this man right here before the people. Then we see the second miracle, courtesy of the Pharisees, because it says the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them. Did you catch that? They didn't say this out loud and question Jesus among the people. They weren't even talking and whispering amongst themselves. They were thinking in their minds, this is blasphemy. Remember, they're there to investigate. Is this man a, a good, right, moral man, a good teacher, maybe the Messiah, or is he a false teacher? They said only God can forgive sins. They thought this in their minds, and Jesus knew their thoughts. And there were three kinds of blasphemy that the Pharisees would be looking out for. The first was when people would blaspheme 
the word of God, they would blaspheme against the law. That's what Paul and Stephen would later be accused of. The second kind of blasphemy was to uh, blaspheme the character, the nature, the, the person of God, to speak and curse God himself. The third and the most serious deserving of death was when a person would claim the authority, the power, or the rights of God and speak on his behalf. And this is what they were accusing Jesus of. And in doing so, there's no longer middle ground. If Jesus claims this level of authority and blasphemes against God, he can't be a good teacher, a moral man, a prophet, because all that he does is evil because he's claiming God's authority. And so they ask this, they are thinking this question in their mind, and Jesus responds to it. And look at his response. Why do you question in your hearts? Man, I'm sure they swallowed hard like, he just answered what I was thinking in my brain. You know, he knows your thoughts. He says, why do you question uh, in your hearts? He says, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? Well, the answer to that is obvious in the sense that it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. You know why? Because no one knows if that just happened or not, right? This guy's lying there on the mat. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And people are going, did it work? We don't know. It's easier to say that than to say rise up and walk because if you say rise up and walk and the dude doesn't move, you don't have the power to heal, right? You don't have that authority to be able to do that. And there were prophets, there were great men of God through whom God performed miraculous signs and wonders. So Jesus is like, the, greater, the, the easier work is to say this, but I've said this, and he goes on and he says, um, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus claims the authority of God. He answers their question. Yes, only God alone can forgive sins. And I am God alone. And I have forgiven this man of his sins. So he addresses the issue head on. Now, there's a difference here. Jesus is claiming the authority of God that he has made the pronouncement and has forgiven the sins. That's different from what I as a minister would do. If I'm talking with someone, sharing about sin in their life, and they're talking about confession and repentance and praying and asking for God's forgiveness, then I can share with them, here's what the Bible says. God says you are forgiven of your sins. I didn't do the forgiving. I'm just telling you what the Bible says about that. And if someone were to hear me saying, God says you're forgiven of your sins and say, Curtis, you just forgave their sins. You know the first thing that's going to come out of my mouth? No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying I forgave the sins. I'm just telling you what the Bible says about how our sins are forgiven and who does the forgiving. But Jesus didn't say, no, no, that's not what I was saying. He says, yes, so that you will know I have the authority Here's what I'm going to do to demonstrate. I'm going to have done the most important work of forgiving of sins. But then he says, but that you know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. The crowd got out of his way at that moment, didn't they? Yeah, they found a way to say, let's let this man through, right? But think about how extensive and how powerful and full and complete Jesus' work in a person's life is. He's forgiven his sins, but he goes ahead and does the, the miracle of healing him of his paralysis as well. And it's instantaneous and it's full and it's complete. We don't know if this man had been paralyzed from birth or if he had grown into a teenager, an adult, something had happened, and then he had become paralyzed. But at any rate, he had been paralyzed for a while. Now, when children begin walking, we celebrate when they take those first steps, right? You know, they, they do that whole wobble thing. Well, we don't expect kids, once they start taking steps, to then start running and to never wobble and fall down again. I mean, parents spend a number of weeks and months with their toddler children holding those fingers and doing this little waddle thing like this, right, so that our kids can practice and develop in that. Even as adults, if you have surgery on a knee, an ankle, a hip, something like that, and you spend some time in bed recovering from that, you go back to therapy and rehab because you've got to learn, you've got to get some of that coordination, some of that strength and that mobility back, not with this man. 
instantly and completely, more than just muscles and bones and tendons, now the experiential part of balance and depth perception, coordination happens. He picks up his bed and he walks and he goes home. That's how complete and full the work of Jesus Christ is in our lives. No detail, no area is left untouched when Jesus moves and works in our lives. And we see the response, verse 26. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. The people were amazed. They were in wonder. They were in awe. But you notice what they said. We have seen extraordinary things today. In Matthew's account of this encounter, he uses a word that says the people were astonished that God had given such authority to man. Here's an important reminder about this encounter and when it comes to sharing the gospel with people. Not everyone is going to respond and place their faith and their trust in Christ. This doesn't say that everyone there believed in Jesus and followed him that day. They said they saw extraordinary things. They were in awe. Matthew says they were astonished that such authority had been given to a man. Church, you need to remember this. When it comes to sharing the gospel, God calls us to share the gospel with other people and then leave the results up to him. You or I will never save anyone. All we're called to do is to share the gospel and trust Jesus to do the work that only he can do in their lives. Because as we can see, with a miracle standing before them, having seen what they just saw with this man's life, not everyone believed in Jesus. We must understand that principle and that truth. Well, let me give you three things from this passage that I want you to remember as as principles of things we can take away. We can think about applying to our lives as we think about our one person. On January 5th, Pastor Dave talked about next week. Here's what we're asking you as an individual to do. We want you to start thinking about one person, one single individual who doesn't know Christ that you will begin praying for and being intentional about cultivating a relationship and in 2020 sharing the gospel with that person. So we want you to be intentional about that, but a couple of things about this passage to help us in that activity. Number one is this, guard your heart against a pharisaical spirit. Guard your heart against having a pharisaical spirit. What do I mean by that? Well, we heard about these Pharisees, that they were religious leaders, uh, that they were ones who were teachers of the law, telling people this is what you should do. But Jesus called them, you know what Jesus called them over and over and over again? Anybody know? In the venue, got it? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. What does a hypocrite do? They say one thing, but do another. They were telling people what they should do, but they themselves were not doing it. So you could say they they sat on a throne of lies. Here's what the Bible says to do, but they're not actually doing it, right? And Jesus denounced them over and over again. You go read Matthew chapter 23 over and over again. Jesus says, you're a hypocrite. You do this. You guys are hypocrites. You do this. One of the times Jesus tells them that they go and they, they convert someone to being a Pharisee. They call them a proselyte. He said, you get a proselyte and you make them. This is Jesus' quote, not mine. You make them twice the, the, the demon of hell that you are. You make them twice the demon of hell that you are. Those are some strong words. I mean, outside of Jesus calling Peter Satan when he rebuked him, I mean, that's as stern as it gets when Jesus says that. And in Luke 5 and 6, we have five encounters where the Pharisees are here listening about Jesus, listening to his teaching, watching his workings. And if you flip over in Luke chapter 5 or Luke 6, verse 11, it says, at the end of all of this, here was their assessment from the very beginning of his ministry. They were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. So these Pharisees had judged, predetermined about Jesus and his ministry, and they wouldn't allow anything that they saw or they heard to change that decision. When it comes to us sharing our faith with people, one of the greatest detriments, one of the greatest detriments to sharing the gospel with people 
is religious people who speak one thing and do another. Or religious people who determine and say, well, that person's not worthy of salvation. That person doesn't want to hear the gospel. That person has this or that going on in his or her life, so I'm not going to share the gospel with them. The Bible doesn't give us that responsibility. But it's easy for us to start as these Pharisees did with a good and right heart, but that for, for that to shift. And the, the greatest, I think one of the, the most sad things about all of this is that because of their hard hearts, the Pharisees missed the gospel. They missed the gospel. Here was Jesus right before them, teaching, doing signs and wonders, miracles, the gospel live and incarnate, incarnate in their presence, and they missed it because it didn't fit their mold, their model, the way they thought things should work. I don't have time to mind the depths of this, but let me give you a book recommendation. Larry uh, Osborne has a book called Accidental Pharisees, a great book about this idea of guarding our hearts because we can become judgmental uh, and focus more on the externals than the internals. And in doing so, we can lose our evangelistic fervor in sharing the gospel with others. So a second thing we see from this passage, a second principle, is to bring others to Jesus. And what I mean by that, obviously, is Jesus isn't here today to come and bring him in, but it's to share the gospel with others. When we share the gospel with others, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit is there to move and work and to do that work which only he could do. This paralytic had four men who were committed to getting this man in the presence of Jesus. Will you be that friend who is committed to making sure that the person that you begin to pray about and think about finds a way to hear the gospel through you? that you know they have heard him and been given the opportunity to respond to the good news, the message of Jesus Christ. Again, sin gives us a picture. It's an object lesson of our spiritual condition. The, the, the leper, uh, that, that miracle there was about the corruption and, and the defilement that sin brings into our life that Jesus is able to heal. Here, the paralytic, he was unable to save and to heal himself. Sin paralyzes us from being able to save ourselves, but Jesus can do that work. Will you do whatever is necessary to help your friend hear the gospel so that Jesus can move and work in his or her life? Bring others to Jesus. Share the gospel with them. Trust that Jesus is able to meet the need in their life. And remember, their greatest need is that of salvation. It's to be forgiven of their sins. So the final thing is this. Be a blank who serves blank well. You're like, well, thanks for nothing, Curtis. That makes no sense. Well, well let, let, me give you, let me give you the global and then bring it down to the specific on these blanks. Write in, be a person who serves others well. Be a person who serves others well. You're thinking, man, I want to pray for this person and I want to share the gospel with them, but how am I going to do that? You be a servant. You start going out of your way, going above and beyond to minister and to care for them. One of the greatest ways to open a door and get a conversation for sharing the gospel is to be a servant. Because we live in a selfish, self-centered world. We talked about this. They couldn't get the man in. No one would get out of the way. In our society today, we think me first in every situation. But when you serve someone, they say, why are you being so kind? Why are you being so generous? Why are you so concerned? Why are you so encouraging? That's because the gospel has changed you. The gospel is transforming you, and then you have an opportunity to share that good news of the gospel. So be a person who serves others well. That's global. But here's how I want you to begin thinking and praying. Be specific. Be a friend who serves your friend well. That's what these men did for their paralytic. Be a neighbor who serves your neighbors well. Be a co-worker who serves your coworkers well. Be a classmate, students, who serves your classmates well. Be a boss who serves his or her employees well. Be an employee who serves his or her boss well. Be a customer who serves your cashier, your server, your lawn care person well. You get the idea here? 
Be a person who serves others well. Why? So that there's the opportunity. The question arises, why are you doing this? Why am I doing this? Well, let me tell you what's made a difference in my life. Who has made a difference in my life and who I know will make a difference in your life as well. Bring others to Jesus. Share the gospel with them. How are we going to do that? Let's serve others well. And ultimately, as we do that and we share the gospel and leave the results up to God, he will do the transforming work of bringing people to himself in salvation.